So I'm from um, an organization called the Center for Home Movies. We are a, a nonprofit organization, and we do just any number of projects relating to home movies and amateur films. Um, mostly we do home movie stuff, but we're also interested in the whole world, the whole spectrum of am amateur filmmaking, including youth media and you know, young people making films. So this, you know, tonight's program all came about like a year, a little more than a year ago, all um, through a Facebook post. I have, a, I have a Facebook friend who I've never actually met, but she pro posted a, you know, this YouTube clip um, that had scenes of the, uh, it's called the Festival of Young Filmmakers from, I think it was 1968 in New York. Um, and it showed all these scenes of this, this gathering, this kind of conference and convention where they brought a bunch of the filmmakers from the earliest, I mean, the youngest one I think was like three years old, um, up until teenagers um, of, you know, of doing all, ki all types of filmmaking. And I noticed that, that there was one person in there who was, actually didn't get very much screen time in that clip, but um, it turned out to be uh, Tim Page, Timmy Page. Um, and so I kept digging and kept digging. Um, and um, as someone who researches amateur film, I'm used to yeah, very quickly hitting dead ends when it comes to finding films and filmmakers. But this one, within, within a matter of hours, I found out this document, this longer documentary about, you know, only about Tim, um, A Day with Timmy Page, was I, could, I went on Amazon. I was watching it, streaming, streaming it on Amazon uh, you know, that, that same morning. Um, there was another YouTube clip that includes the uh, day with Timmy Page, but also an interview that he did with public TV station. So I got to see him talking more about his films, you know, back, in, back at the time when he was still 13. Um, and, you know, I kept looking around and said, oh, he actually, it turns out he wrote a memoir about his childhood, uh, his, his childhood, that includes long sections of his filmmaking. So, you know, very quickly I had this huge amount of information about this, these films and this filmmaker. Turns out, you know, um, turns out we had, um, you know, a couple of mutual friends. So I wrote, I wrote to one of them and asked how I could get in touch with them. And so, you know, within a minute I had his email address. Within a day, he and I were Facebook friends. Um, and so, you know, I was overwhelmed with all of this, all of this stuff that I had about him. But the one thing I didn't have was any of his films. So I started asking him, you know, where are they? Um, and it turns out that he had uh, um, um, put them in, in his papers, which are at the University of Connecticut. Um, he hadn't, you know, they were eight millimeter, and none of them had been digitized. So I, you know, I couldn't see them any easily, easily without. I was expecting I'd have to go up to Connecticut and take a look at them. Uh, so we started, you know, communicating with the archivist at the University of Connecticut, um, and but then, you know, also I think the same day, all this all happened within two days. I wrote to Dina because you know I knew that Tim was was a professor at USC, so I said, hey, Dina, are you going interested in these films by this professor at USC? Within a few minutes, uh, Dina wrote back and said, oh yeah, I'll digitize them all. Um, so that started the whole that started the whole digitization uh, process. Um, and uh, so then, yeah, so then you know, Dina sort of was gradually making them all available to us. And they were just as interesting and just as exciting as, as, as we had expected. Um, and uh, so as, you know, as Tim and I were kind of seeing more and more of them, I started regularly bugging Dina and said, you know, we, we, people have got to see these, we've got to do something with them. So, so we pushed in to organize this, this show here tonight. So this, this is all, all how we got here. Um, so the way tonight's program is we're going to have four sh um, film sections, all, all short, um, and then in between each of the, uh, of the you know, film screenings, then um, Tim and I will be talking about his, his life, his filmmaking, and the, the films themselves. So we're going to start out with the shortest one, which is probably I'm guessing it must have been the most widely seen of them because it was sponsored by Eastman Kodak and was a television commercial. Hello, I'm Tim Page and uh, I'm speaking from my home in Storrs, Connecticut in my bedroom. I've been making movies just about uh, a year and two months. Camera! 
You're watching Tim Page, a young man busy at one of America's fastest growing ways to have fun, making movies. With today's Kodak Instamatic movie cameras, everyone is in on the movie scene, and the enthusiasm is growing every day. It's a great way to learn. And it's a great time to get started in Super 8 movies. See all the Kodak Instamatic cameras. They start at less than $30 at your Kodak dealers. Great! Action! Camera! 52 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I'll be asking some questions today. Um, we'll get more, we'll kind of get more general as the evening or as the program progresses. Um, I want to start out with um, kind of more specific questions about the David Tim Page, which is the next film we'll see, which is the film which is about him and about his filmmaking. Um, but I mean, just just tell us how this how it came about. How did you get a, how did a documentary get to be made about? Him? Um, well, it was, it was interesting. First of all, let me thank you all for being here. I recognize a lot of faces. I'm really glad you could come. And uh, so we'll, 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 we'll talk about a lot of things. But um, the way that film happened was I had discovered my dad's movie camera about a year or so earlier. And before that, I had um, discovered that I was fascinated by silent films. So I asked my dad to come take a picture of all of us filming in the backyard um, and he and he made it my first film and then slowly but surely I learned how to use a camera and I sort of stole it from him and we started making movies every I don't know every uh, month or so uh, total budget for one of those is maybe $25 um, and my parents were generous with helping me out with that and uh, there was one fellow who was in my movies um, named Paul Waxman. And his cousin was a young filmmaker in New York, a guy named David Hoffman. And he made, um, it, it, the way it started was he decided to come watch some of the movies that I did and just take some film. And he liked the film and he liked the way I talked enough so that the following day he came and filmed me making a movie. And it was it was a lot of fun. Um, I was thrilled. I was a you know, I guess I was twelve, and um, it it was it was just great to have somebody here and taking movies. And it, this was right at a time when everybody was discovering Marshall McLuhan, and discovering the idea that you could actually make your own films and your own you know the do-it-yourself um, idea behind things. And so we made the film. And the film got, um, was shown quite a lot. It was reviewed a number of places. And uh, then Dave went to Kodak, or to <laughs> J. Walter Thompson, which was the ad firm, and uh, suggested this film, which is kind of Day with Timmy Page in miniature. It begins almost the exact same way. And, um, and then people just, it, it was suddenly the year of young filmmakers, and I was invited um, down to New York to be part of this, and then in the fall of 1968, um, they, they showed Day with Timmy Page at the New York Film Festival as the introduction to a, um, to a film that was actually about children called Hugo and Josephine, which I... I see is on Amazon now, and I, I want to look it up and see it again. But it, you know, it was a very exciting time, and I enjoyed it and had a a good time doing it. And uh, the, then the the film, uh, you know, continued and continued to be shown. And throughout my life, I've run into people who've seen it and were interested in seeing it. Um, I have my own problems with film because uh, I. Most of the opinions that you will hear when you watch A Day with Timmy Page were about silent movies, which I had no earthly way of seeing in those <laughs> days. One that I did see was The Birth of a Nation, and I, I'm all excited over it. I don't think I recognize the incredible racism that's in the film, but I was a 10-year-old kid in an all-white part of Connecticut. I just, I didn't get it, and I was fascinated 
by the, the history of it and the history of these other films, most of which I had not seen at that point. Um, and I, you know, it kind of talked an okay game and showed my films. Um, and, uh, you know, the film has continued to be, be shown ever since. We're going to show it to you now or in, in a few moments. And uh, um, it's strange for me to look back uh, because it, it suddenly made me kind of famous, especially with the commercial. And getting famous when you're really, really young, especially if you're in a town which is far away from any um, big city or anything like that, or any place you can actually do something with this fascination and this interest. Um, it was, you know, it was, you know, kind of an interesting time, but we'll talk more about that once you see uh, A Day with Timmy Page. This has been restored, I should add, as is everything tonight by Dino Everett and the uh, USC Hugh M. Hefner Archive of the Music Moving Image. And I'm terribly grateful for it. And uh, um, so I, I hope you'll enjoy it. I'm actually looking forward to seeing it myself uh, after all these years. So let's take a look. I have a lot of fun because I think of technique. I like to uh, every so often uh, taking my fist. I thought maybe it would be great to add a thrill, so it should maybe a fix that the camera would be good. And so, uh, so I said, Rick, let's have some fun. I'm good at that. Okay, right. very strange to see yourself back then and recognize a lot of the same motions and the sort of intensity and the bizarre films that were, were being made. Um, I, I was a little too hard on the kid before. Um, I'd actually seen all the movies except Intolerance, which I didn't see for a really, really long time, despite my amazed uh, Praise it. I actually haven't seen that in a long time, and I'm getting to the point where I can sort of laugh at it, you know, in a, in a funny way, um, because it really did capture what we used to do. We used to just all get together with a few friends and run around and throw each other around and do do crazy things and lots of violence, lots of shooting, all all sorts of stuff like that. It was the heyday of the Man from Uncle and all these shows on television which had all sorts of spy stuff, and we were interested in that. We were also sort of interested, or, or I was interested, in um, you know, just uh, managing to say something about what we were doing. The, the films that they used in that film are actually some of my very first, um, and I remember I was very upset because they're about, about cut in half. The stories are really simple, but not quite as simple as the ones there were. Um, but anyway, it's, it, it's fun. It was great fun for me. It was, um, and it, I'm, I'm grateful to have it all these years later and see, see what it was like. Um, although the kid is a little scary here and there. <laughs> um, you actually anticipated a lot of my questions. But one, okay. of, one of the most interesting thing, things about this film and also what you've written about in more in depth in, in parallel play is about how these films and making these films how how that became like a social um it's social act play but also there's there's some serious um, aspects of it too as you were relating to your friends um so how did you feel about that do you remember what you felt about that at the time as far as your your connection with friends and the filmmaking and then looking back what's your perspective on that well, you know, the fact is I really didn't know how to make friends. Um, I was somebody who was very imperious about a lot of things with kids on the playground, and I was a bully magnet. Um, and so finally some teachers were kind enough to let me stay in at recess and just read about anything I wanted. And there was a 
big world book encyclopedia there, and I, I think I read pretty much all of it um, by, by a certain point. But what, and it was one of the things that inspired me to do films, but one of the things about films is, you know, I had this camera, I had this idea, you know, and what kid doesn't want to be a movie star, at least for a you know, brief period of time. And so people would come over and they would be in these films and then I'd have them over and we'd watch them and, you know, have fun. And I, I, I really was about as cold-blooded as I sounded in there. It was me with the camera, me making the choices of who would be in a film. And I remember my friends would tell me they never had any idea what the films I was making about <laughs> were actually about. So um, I, I hope you all got a copy of this because it, it'll t it'll tell you a lot about uh, about about these films. But um, so what happened was um, when that Kodak commercial was made, they gave me a brand new Super 8 camera. So that was thrilling for me. Uh, still no sound but much, much better picture. And uh, it was then that I started, well, I I'd, I'd started doing with some eight millimeter films, but I, I generally started making about 10 minute movies. Those movies were one 50 foot reel um, each. And, uh, but then I started doing like three or four 50 foot reels uh, and then splicing them together. I got one of those little film editors and lots of splice tape, which Dino can attest to the fact that they've all fallen off. <laughs> and he was kind enough to continue the films as the tapes were all falling all over the place when he was looking at it. Um, and, you know, I, I, I kept making films a lot over the weekends, and they were fun. Um, but then when I got to be about 13, um, as, as I think happens to a lot of people, you're going to see two of my films tonight. And they're both to an enormous amount about adolescent angst. Um, and I'm, I'm proud on some level of both of them, even though, you know, I mean, there was no do way of doing retakes. When we were done with the films, we had to take whatever we had, take them to the drugstore, wait a week or 10 days or sometimes two weeks or once or twice forever when they were lost, and then get them back and try to turn them into some kind of film. So. There was no way of doing retakes at all. I never had any lessons. I just sort of self-taught myself. Um, and so there, you know, there came a time when I decided I wanted to do something a little different than everybody shooting everybody and dancing around and all that sort of faux Griffith, Griffith stuff, which you see a lot of in those films. Um, and so. The film which I want to show to you now, which has never ever been seen by a crowd, probably the entire number of people who have seen these films are fewer than the number of people who are in this room. But I decided finally I wanted to try to do something that was at least a vague bit of grown up. So I got some friends together. We, we made, it's still, it's the only film I ever made about kids being kids. Um, and. Uh, uh, it's, it's a movie about a bullied kid shot in my neighborhood in stores. Pretty autobiographical in some ways, although I, for all my kind words for my own acting in A Day with Timmy Page, I was an overactor like mad, and my brother was actually a much, much better actor than I was. So I got him to star in it, and I got some wonderful friends from the neighborhoods to play the bullies. Uh, they're all dead. They died before they were 50 years old. You know, accidents, drugs, things like that. Um, and uh, we made this this little film, which I like because it's simple, and because I'm actually trying to break through and talk to people um, in a way which I wasn't in that film uh, before and with the other films. I was just ordering them what to, what to do, say do this, do that. And this is actually a somewhat autobiographical film with some really goofy animation in the middle of it, um, which involves a, a heating room and a teddy bear and a string and a safety pin behind the teddy bear, and then we got the teddy bear to dance. Um, but I, I rather liked the film, and um, I, 
I, show, I, I wish I'd cut parts of it, but one of the rules they told me when they were going to do this was you can't do any do-overs. And of course, that makes sense. You don't want some 60-year-old man come in and you know, say, oh, I could do that better now and I could cut that out. So there are a lot of errors in this and there are things that should have been retaken and, and so on. But, but I, I do think there is, there is an effort to try to, um, uh, to, to reach an audience and to try to be a little grown up and not just be a cute kid screaming and yelling. Um, one thing also I like in this is we are using a score uh, be, because very shortly after this I stopped making films and I started getting involved in music. And so when I used to show this movie when I was about 16 or 17, I found that two selections from a Hindemith Kammermusik, um, Paul Hindemith, uh, German-American composer, and I used the third movement in its entirety for the lonely scenes when the boy is walking down the street and he's being chased by these bullies and then I use just a snippet of the last movement of this Kamu Musik as the finale and this is exactly the way I used to show it back in 1972 and 73 and with the help of my son John Page and also with the people in the studio and Dino and everybody else um, I managed to, to synchronize it here exactly to the film and yes, did you want to? No, I was giving you the one minute. The one minute, yeah, I'm, I'm almost done. I, I didn't mean to over talk, but I did want to give some explanation to what this thing, this thing is. And one minute is fine, and I won't even use it. Did you want to say anything? I'm sorry, I still yak a lot. I've been waiting years for people to see these, and I, I hope you'll enjoy it. And it's called Opus 21 because it was my 21st film and also because I thought that sounded avant-garde. <laughs>
serious quote unquote attempt at art uh, at, you know in a place where I didn't know anywhere I could show these films I saw no future in it you know I knew where they made films but there was there was a film school at the college but but um, so I don't know what kept me going except the fact that I really wanted to say something about my condition at this time and yeah we'd gone to Venezuela for my father's sabbatical in the in summer of 69 and I went to school there and they were very very different they're all these sophisticated you know wealthy um, kids who were in Venezuela, probably a lot of them working for the oil companies and things like that. And um, it was an American school and I was such a fish out of water. I mean, in stores the kids had come to grips with my, stores Connecticut that is, uh, you know, people had come to grips with my, my um, eccentricities. But here it was a new sort of bullying because puberty had entered into the whole thing and everybody was, you know, you know, it was, it was just that awful, awful moment of early teen life. And I was away from the friends that I'd grown up with. I didn't speak much Spanish. I was missing my friends terribly. And I, I made this strange film, which is unlike anything else I did. And I think it's actually less successful than Opus 21, but I think there are parts in it which I really, really like because I was really doing some experimental things with this, like taking old shots from my films and, and getting them done in black and white. And, and anyway, so far as I can tell, the whole film, I brought all my films to Venezuela, I should add. That's how important they were to me then. Um, but so far as I can tell, this is really just about being, you know, depressed and being 15 and looking away on people who could have been, you know, another light year from me at that point, and stuck down in a place which I really didn't like at that particular point. And uh, so, so it's a really anguished film. One interesting thing about it is my, my, my father took my brother and sister to a bullfight. I refused to go, even at that age. That was just something I did not want to see. But one of my siblings brought the other camera that Kodak had given me, and they took pictures of the bullfight, and they all came out blurred. And so everyone thought, oh, that's garbage. And I thought, no, it's not. That's wonderful. You know, think of the world as a blurred bullfight. <laughs> and, and so you've got this poor bull being killed, slaughtered on camera, and, and it's all in a blur. And I didn't make the blur. I just put it like that. There's also some stuff in the middle. There's a whole subplot about some guy who can't walk very well, who has a, um, who uh, has a bird, and it doesn't look at all like a real life bird, but he gets in a fight with somebody and the guy smashes it. And that was something I made in stores before I left as part of a film that I wanted to make, but I never finished it. So I threw it in here thinking, okay, it'll fit with all the gloom and doom of the rest of the film. It doesn't really work. But uh, at the end of the film, and something I liked a lot, was that I used the actual footage from these other films, and then I would still it, and they'd become black and white. And that was just about being lost and never being able to recapture things and, and being unbelievably miserable. Now this one, um, I did the music for this myself um, a week or so ago with an improvisation which sounds a little bit Phil Glassy, I have to admit, and, and a chord that, weirdly enough, I, I didn't know how it's going to start the film. I planned to do it just with the still pictures, and then in the middle of the night I had this dream that there was this chord and it was like a gonging bell, and then I couldn't get the chord in the morning, but I went to the studio where we recorded this, uh, the Los Angeles uh, Recording School, um, and I, um, I got the chord immediately. So, so I spent about two hours putting together a, a score for this uh, from an improvisation which I've been playing for, I don't know, five or six years. And uh, so it, it's, it's me playing the piano and it's, it's an actual professional recording and I guess I own the copyright on this, so we won't have any trouble with that. But um, so anyway, the film is called Kyrie, and it's 
it's a requiem for all the human race, and it basically just says life is horrible and miserable, and it's not going to get any better. And then it does, or at least it did for me. Anything else? Okay, this was, as I say, just about my last film, and parts of it are pretty good, I think, kind of. So, <laughs> that's basically it. I can't tell you much more about that, except that um, I, you know, it, it, when, I was, when I was 45, I was diagnosed with what was then called Asperger's syndrome and is now called the um, part, being part of the autistic spectrum. And um, I really think, you know, as I look back at these, as I was starting to try to create something that was personal um, and also get to know people and, and, uh, and express myself, um, I, I, I look at these and I see a lot of growth. I, I stopped doing filmmaking immediately and acted out for a few years after that. And uh, then I started writing and I started doing a lot of other things and, and teaching. And one of the reasons I'm so delighted this is taking place here tonight um, is the fact that the Echo Park Film Center does some teaching. I, I wonder if, you, you know, I've, I've, I've thought about a lot in the past and wondered what would happen if somebody had actually said, well, this is kind of interesting, that doesn't really work, you know, you can try doing this or that, and maybe I would have learned something, but uh, and in a strange way, it's all kind of just learning about life and experience, and uh, it's been very odd to revisit these, and I hope you've enjoyed some of them, and uh, I, I'm honored by your presence tonight, and uh, I guess that's it. Thanks to everybody.